Come on, if you're thankful for the love of Jesus, clap your hands like you're grateful. Come on, if your hands are free to clap and praise him. Worship him because of who he is. There's no love greater. There's no name greater. There's no power greater. Come on, there is no stronghold. There's no chain. There's no darkness that can contend with the name that's above every name. Amen. If you feel his presence, somebody clap your hands as loud as you can clap them. Come on, if you're thankful for the love, if you're thankful for the blood, if you're thankful for the soul-saving power in the name of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come on, somebody exercise your faith and worship him. Come on, somebody exercise thanksgiving and worship him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. There is, there is, there is no power greater than the power of the one true and living I'm convinced that there are times that we coincidentally through the matriculation of life we begin to take ownership of strongholds in our lives addictions situations that we've been in so long that we feel that we should own them that they they are a finite part of our lives. But I, I want to declare something in the house right now. The Holy Ghost is speaking. And I want to tell you that there is no stronghold that is in your life that you have to live with. There is no chain in your life that you have to, come on, you don't have to own it. It's not your burden to bear. You can give it to God and don't pick it back up. Come on, this liberty, you can, you can be free tonight in the name of Jesus. So I wish some free people would clap your hands. Come on, you can be set free by the power in the name. And come on, I wish somebody would shout the name of Jesus. Come on, shout it again. This, this freedom and liberty in the name of Jesus. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost ministering already. Amen. And without delay, I want to bring you to the word of the Lord tonight as quickly as we can. Psalm 1 and 1. Psalm 1 and 1. And I'll also be bringing your attention to 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse number 3. And while you're turning there, God has, has definitively been speaking to us. And I'm humbly and eternally grateful for a clear word that can minister to hearts of people and minds of people and, and souls of people. Has anybody been blessed by the voice of God speaking to us? Come on, it's not me. It's not, it's not the preacher. We ought, we ought to know that God's been speaking to us. And I pray that God will minister to me tonight, that God will minister to you. Amen. Somebody in this room will undoubtedly leave free if you desire to break free. The preacher can preach. The singers can sing. The sermon can be sermonized. But if you don't want to break free, chains remain shackles remain but if you said tonight every stronghold must come down if you say tonight every battle in my mind it is over if you say tonight that tonight's the last night I tell you by the name of Jesus tonight can be the last night Tonight, I pray that God...
God's spirit can reverse what I feel that he's speaking to me reverse the curse of complacency being content with where you are I'm telling you right now you do not have to stay where you are if you are if your life is broken if you are in a world in a whirlwind of decadence if your spiritual life your prayer life is locked down and you haven't shouted in a long time I come to tell you you do not have to stay in that situation you don't have to you don't have to stay there come on anybody hear me right now there there's a way to reverse it Psalm 1 and 1 tells us bless is the man that walketh not somebody shout walk, walk. that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth somebody shout stand standeth standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth somebody shout sit or sitteth in the seat of the scornful walk stand sit walk stand sit and lastly second kings seven and three the famine of the land was upon the people and there was famine in the land that was so grotesque and great that people were dying by the minute and there were four leprous men outside the gate of the city the bible says and there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate the famine was great in the city people were shriveling and dying withering their bones were showing there was no food in the land people were sick and ill people people were not were not in a great condition physically and i would imagine their emotional state of mind was in turmoil as well but something got a hold of the spirit of these four men i pray i'm preaching to somebody in the house something got a hold of them and they refused to stay where they were come on i hope somebody's hearing me you don't have to live in depression you don't have to stay you can refuse you can refuse you can refuse and say i'm getting my shout back i'm getting my joy back i'm getting my victory back i'm getting my family back i'm getting my hat and it matters hear me it matters it matters who you are connected to I wish I was in a preaching church right now. Can I tell you, I like, I like church folks that like to shout and dance. Because it matters who you're connected to. I like, I like saints that like to go to prayer meeting. Because when you're going through it, it matters who you're connected to. And the Bible says that one, they looked one to another. They said, what are we doing, boys? They said, why sit we here until we die? Tonight, with the help of God, I pray that God will reverse the curse of complacency. It's already been happening in service. I'm telling you something. The Holy Ghost has been trying to pull some of you off of your pew. I, can, it's all right if I just preach to tell you and tell you what God's to, God's been trying. Some of you have, have found yourself to be in a seat of complacency, but I pray you get your shout back before the night is over. I pray you get your family back before tonight is over. I wish somebody would praise God like you love Him. Come on, clap your hands and love Him. Come on, clap your hands and love him. Come on, this is a worshiping church. Come on, this is a dancing church. This is an aisle running. Come on, if you gotta, if you gotta let your feet leap, leave the floor, you need to leap for joy right now. Amen. 
Amen. Somebody shout the seat. Amen. I want to preach tonight about the seat of death. The seat of death. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, don't sit down too long. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise God. Don't sit down too long. I happen to be a, a lover of history, as odd as that sounds. I'm pretty sure that science and history are probably the least favorite subjects of most individuals in schooling. But oddly enough, history and science were two of my favorite subjects. And I happened to marry a woman that coincidentally is likewise infatuated with history. And so from time to time when we are on vacation, we find ourselves scrolling in museums and spending hours looking at artifacts in history because history... History is powerful. Some are saying, there's a saying that if you don't know your history, that you are bound to repeat it. Some history is worth knowing. Some history is worth evaluating. What I love about history is when you dig into history, you start learning the origins of where things come from. People hop into cars, we get on planes, and most times we don't think about where they originated from, the complex, the complex day of life when the conveniences and the comforts of our world today did not exist. I know that teenagers would want to drive a Tesla, but how would you like a horse and carriage for your sweet 16? Life, life change. History is different. Bishop said, give me a horse and carriage in it. At least you wouldn't have to pay for gas. Praise God. But history is interesting. And being a lover of history, there's an individual that you probably have never even took time to know who he is. But I'm quite sure you are familiar with his invention, Alfred. P. Southwick, a engineer, a steamboat engineer, a doctor with many degrees, and he was not only a doctor, not only an engineer, but he was also a dentist. And also among his educational prowess and his notoriety, Alfred P. Southwick was also a well-known Inventor, somebody shout inventor. A well known inventor. You probably did not know who he was. You don't recognize his name, but one day Alfred heard the story of a man that was intoxicated. And this intoxicated man, this is the late 1800s, 1881. To be exact, this intoxicated man around the same time that the world was going through changes, steamboats and trains were cascading the country, light bulbs were introduced to the world, and with the introduction of light bulbs came the introduction of electricity. And he heard the story, not many people knowing how powerful electricity was. He heard the story of an intoxicated man that one drunken night he found himself near a power line and grabbing a hold of the line for stability. This man quickly found out how powerful electricity was without a moment's warning, without even two thoughts about it. He grabbed a hold of the electrical line being intoxicated as he was. And he found out that electricity was powerful enough to bring a man to death. Knowing that electricity, as silent of a killer as it was, Alfred's mind got to wondering. Because at this time in America, 
capital punishment for death. Somebody shout death. The capital punishment for death was death by lynching. The slow, grueling death of tying a man, tying a criminal to a rope and watching a horse leave him from beneath him and the slow gagging breathing, the slow, the slow life leaving one's body by hanging from a tree was a sight that many people thought was grotesque and inhumane. But at the time, that was the way that criminals found their maker. Alfred, being an inventor, being a doctor, he thought about it long and hard, and as inhumane as lynching was, he thought that there had to be a more comfortable, humane way for people to die. I, I would venture to say, and I would probably venture to argue that in my guesstimation, I don't think there's any such thing as a comfortable way to die. I, I don't think that anybody here would say, you know, I've thought long and hard, and I think that dying would be a good way this way. I, I, know, I know that some of us, I know some of us would think about death, and I don't think anybody wants to think about it too long to think about of a comfortable way to die. But Alfred, Alfred might not be known by name, but Alfred in 1881, being a dentist, performing surgical procedures on the mouth of patients, trying to make them comfortable in an uncomfortable situation in a dentist chair, he decided that it's quite possible to create a contraption of comfortability. The seat death, also known as the electric chair. I want to preach to you tonight because that origin of that electric chair might not be prominent enough in your mind to connect the dots with scripture, but I pray somebody tonight will get out of your comfort zone because if the adversary had his way, he would lull you to sleep. And you will go from losing your shout, and it doesn't stop there. I hope somebody's hearing me right now. Because if he can stop you from shouting, he can stop you from singing. And if he can stop you from singing, he can stop you from praying. I wish, I, I wish it wasn't as quiet as it is right now. Because this is an apostolic Pentecostal church. And you better not sit on your seat too long. Because we're made to worship. I wish, I wish I had two or three people. Come on, if you walked in the house tonight, I didn't come here with the intent to sit on my seat too long because when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon me, David said, I, I just feel like dancing. If something gets a hold of me. I can't sit down too long. I gotta move my feet. I've got to move. I wish somebody would dance and praise God like he's been good to you. I wish somebody would praise God. Come on, lift up your voice. Come on, if this was a dead church, you are free to sit. If this was a dead church, you are free to nod. If, you are, if this was a dead church, you can go ahead and sleep a little bit. But when the Spirit of God gets to moving, the Bible says that when they came in one place with one accord, then suddenly there was a sound from heaven like as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled. I wish somebody would clap your hands like the Holy Ghost is moving. Somebody shout the seat. And so I, I want to preach to somebody because sometimes, sometimes we end up in the seat of death before we even realize what happened. Uh, I hope somebody's hearing me right now. If you, ever, if you ever sat down long enough to think, you get down in hard life and hard situations and, and you look around and you say, what happened? I, I used to be an aisle runner, but what happened? I used to be a soul winner, but what happened? 
I hope I'm preaching to somebody right now. I, I used to be the first one to show up to service, but what happened? I used to be the last one to leave prayer meeting, but what, but what happened? What, what, what transpired? I, I'm not the same saint I used to be. I hope I'm not preaching too plainly right now. I, 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 know, I know that life is hard and I know that we're busy, but if we're not careful, uh, we will find ourselves being complacent uh, and being so comfortable that, that we'll go from walking to standing to, to sitting. I hope somebody's hearing me right now. Listen, you never get too old and you never get too mature as a saint of God. Uh, that it's okay to stop clapping your hands. I wish somebody was talking back to me. I listen, I, I know your knees might not work like they used to, uh, but at least you still can move your fingers. Uh, at least you still can lift up your voice. Uh, at least you can still shout, uh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Lord, you're worthy uh, of all of my praise. Uh, with every fiber of my being, uh, let everything uh, that has breath, Come on, if you're not dead yet, you got a reason to praise God. If you got breath in your body, if you've got oxygen in your lungs, you still got a reason to get off of your seat. I wish, I wish somebody was shouting with me. Come on, I wish some, come on, take 10 seconds. I got a reason. I still got my family in church. I still got my right mind. I still got my, I wish somebody would say, I'm not sitting down too long. God, you've been too. Sometimes, sometimes, if we're not careful, somebody say, if we're not careful. Sometimes if we're not careful, we start hanging around folk that are not good for us. Woo. You, start, you, start, you start communing with people that are not good for your spiritual well-being. If you start sitting next to a dead head, it won't be long, you'll be dead. There's an old saying that says, show me your five friends and I'll show you your future. That's why when the Holy Ghost was speaking and the Holy Ghost was moving, uh, he said, you need to find somebody to shout with. Uh, you need to find somebody to dance with. Uh, hey, you don't need to go talk to the doubters uh, when you need a miracle. Uh, you need to link up with somebody that's got faith uh, and say, hey, sis, uh, I believe with you. Uh, hey, brother, uh, I'm going to fast with you. Uh, hey, brother, uh, hey, 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 you need to change friends. Uh, if you... Hey, don't sit down too long. Don't get too comfortable. You need to find somebody that's saying, hey, I was glad when they said unto me, we're going to the house of the Lord. I can't stay home. I can't sit too long. If you sit around with couch potatoes, you'll become a potato. why the old folks is maybe maybe i'm preaching too plainly the old folks would say it's one bad apple spoil a bunch hey you try to wonder what happened this is why this is why god was trying he was trying to give us uh, the people it went because when the people of god are around the other people of god uh, they're strengthening the congregation uh, you don't need to go complaining to your co-workers uh, when you got troubles in your marriage uh, because they'll tell you hey i will leave him uh, if i was you uh, i'll walk out uh, if i was you uh, but when you get to the house of god uh, they'll say no hold on sister uh, because they uh, that wait upon the lord uh, shall renew their strength uh, i know you feel weak and weary uh, but hold on to your marriage Hold on. Hey, hey, hey. Because they that wait. He said they shall walk and not grow weary. They shall run. They shall run and not faint. But he never said they shall sit. They shall mount upon wings like eagles. They shall walk, they shall run. 
they shall fly, but he never said they shall sit. Because there's a progression. I want somebody to hear me right now in the Holy Ghost. There's a progression of a casualty that awaits when you start hanging around the wrong folks. He said, blessed, blessed is the man that walketh not. Hear me right now. That walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. If there's folks that are saying, you know, I, I heard what Pastor said, but I don't know, I don't know if you really need to do that. Come on, we're still in revival right now. I know what that church preaches, but I, I've come to a revelation. I, it doesn't take all of that. And you start walking and talking and talking and walking with the counsel of the ungodly. And your posture will start to change. Whew, I feel the Holy Ghost talking. Your posture will begin to change because what Psalms 1 is, it is the digression. It is the trajectory of comfort. And the one thing the adversary wants you to do in the last days, the Bible says that when the bridegroom came and there was a sound that came, there was some that had oil in their lips and the rest of them were too comfortable. They hung out with the wrong five. I hope somebody's hearing me right now. I'm just, I'm just telling you what the Holy Ghost is telling me. I, I don't know where we're going, but I'm just going to walk in the Holy Ghost. Uh, there were five wise and there were five foolish versions. Uh, and it just so happened that the one five was hanging out with the wrong five. And so you go from walking in the counsel of the ungodly to standing in the way of sinners. Can I tell you something, young ladies? Can I tell you something? There is nothing, there is nothing about the world uh, that is so appeasing uh, that you have to have friends that are in the world. I wish I had some mamas backing me up right now. There's nothing wrong with the youth group. There's nothing wrong with the church. Well, I wish they had more boys here. I'm telling you, if you get a relationship with God, you won't be worried about not one boy at that school. You won't worry about what's popular, who's popular, who to hang out with, who's on TikTok, who's on Be Real, who's on social media. You wouldn't be worried about the... Because it's the invitation of comfort uh, that the adversary would tell you that you are okay. And when we should be walking with God, we change our posture. We change our posture from walking with God to walking in the counsel of the ungodly. And then we walk and then we stand. When you start hanging around people, that their conversation is never about God. I hope somebody's hearing me right now. You got to be careful when you are too comfortable with the world. If they start, if they start telling uncolored, off-colored jokes and you start laughing. Don't wonder why it's hard to feel the presence of God. Because you go from walking to standing city he said blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of the sinner nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful because there's something about the seat of death that when you get too comfortable in church you miss the presence that's at church I, 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 know this might, I know this might feel like things are off on a Sunday night, but I promise you, they're so on. I wish I could come tap you on the shoulder right now. 
Because when you stop amening the preaching uh, and when you stop singing the songs uh, and when you're just comfortable and you're swaying uh, and you're standing, uh, you go from standing to sitting uh, to walking out the back door. Hey, people don't backslide overnight. Uh, they go, they find themselves uh, in a comfort zone uh, that the presence of God doesn't move them anymore. Uh, they'll rather hang out at work. Uh, they'll rather hang out. Can, can I tell you something? It scares me to death when as soon as altar call is over, you dart through the door. Because sitting gets you so comfortable that you forget how to kneel. And so the psalmist is trying to tell us, can I tell you what I'm trying to tell you? Don't get too comfortable. If you ever get to a point that you stop repenting, you better take, you better beware. You ought to always come to the house of God and say, God, is there anything in me that's not right? Am I not doing something right? Is there more I can do for you? God, am I not praying enough? Am I not worshiping enough? Am I not dead? When was the last time that I put an extra dollar in the offering? When was the last time? Hey, if you stop paying your tithes, you better wonder what's wrong. I wish somebody was hearing me right now. When you start wondering what's wrong, could it be that your posture went from walking to standing to sitting? Am I, I'm not even going to ask if I'm preaching to anybody tonight. When the presence of God, does no lo- it no longer moves you. When the spirit of God no longer affects you. When you have become numb to the preaching, you're getting strapped to the chair. You're getting ready to check out. You're getting ready for your last breath and you don't even know it. When you sit and the pew becomes a lazy boy. My God, I wish, I wish we didn't have pad a pew sometime. I bet if that seat was, was full of lumber and splinter, you wouldn't sit down too long in church. That wallet starts getting uncomfortable in that back pocket and you got to get up. Hey, you don't, hey, you don't need an uncomfortable seat to, to get out of your seat. You need to be filled by the Spirit and moved by the Spirit. That when the Holy Ghost starts to move in, I can't sit down. I can't keep quiet. I got to run. I got to move. I got to go from sitting to standing to walking to running. It should be the reverse of the curse of comfortability. You know what? I'm a young preacher. I got a lot of flaws as a preacher. uh, And one of my problems is I take way too long uh, in preliminaries. But sorry if I don't feel sorry for you. Because I'm standing the whole time. I don't get a chance to sit in church. I don't feel sorry for you one bit. I'm taking my apologies back. I've talked to my preacher friends. I said, man, my average time in preliminaries is 12 minutes. Well, sorry, I'm standing for 45. Because you shouldn't get too comfortable when you get to the presence of God. Something in you is saying, oh, I can feel something. I, I, I agree with the word. Oh, he's speaking to my family. He's preaching to my heart. Oh, God, thank you, Jesus. Oh, you got to lift your hands at some time. You got to get off your seat at some time. If you... Some of you ain't moved yet. And I'm just wondering, why are you so comfortable? I feel the Holy Ghost right now. You get so comfortable. You get so comfortable that the church becomes a theatrical production. Some, some folks just come up to see, just come to see who's going to act crazy tonight. You won't see a good show. Hey, hey, maybe the show would work a whole lot better if you was doing some shouting. 
Maybe, maybe you would, maybe you would enjoy the service a little bit more if you would say amen sometime. But can I, can I tell you something? It is like iron sharpening iron when it comes to the house of God. And I want to be around people that are saying, we're going forward. We're moving. We're not going to sit here and die. We're not going to shrivel up. Hey, sis, I know you're battling in your family, but grab my hand. We're going to walk around the church and pray a little bit. Hey, grab my hand. I'm going to bleed the blood of Jesus for my family. I- I'm not letting you sit there. I'm not letting you wallow in depression. I'm not letting you go down in the decadence. Hey, you got to get off your seat sometime. Alfred had his way. He said, there's a comfortable way to die. Strap them to the seat. Make them feel comfortable. Because when you sit down, your muscular system relaxes. Is this all right tonight? Can I tell you something? God likes effort. And it takes more effort to worship than it does to sit. I wish, I wish, I wish some of you were listening to me right now. It takes way more effort to pray than to keep your mouth closed. But can I tell you, I dare you, I double dog dare you to be hungry and you just stand in front of the oven and don't open it. I double dog dare you to set a pot on the stove and say, I command you to bring forth food. I dare you to sit in front of a stove and watch and see if the meal gets cooked. When was the last time you sat and cooked a meal? No, it takes movement. You got to go from the stove to the counter uh, to the pantry. You got you to move uh, if something's going to be made. Uh, hey, can I tell you, if you're going to get a miracle, uh, you better understand. Uh, it takes movement. Uh, it takes you getting involved. Uh, it takes an effort. Uh, God's not going to drop a miracle uh, in your lap. Uh, he's not going to bless a dead head. Uh, you got to get off of your seat. Uh, you can't sit there and be blessed. Blessed is the man that's not sitting. I wish somebody would clap your hands if you want to be blessed. He said the man that's not sitting, the man that's not standing, the man that's not walking where he shouldn't be walking. You better walk with God if you're going to walk. You better stand with God if you're going to stand. You better. I'm just trying to help somebody. I'm just trying to help somebody get what you lost. I'm just trying to help somebody get your shout back. Because it's been way too long. I'm just trying to help somebody get your victory back. You, you know, you know, you know, if, you, if your victory has been set on a shelf, you know how you're going to get it. You got to get off your seat. There's some things you can't reach way up there. Hey, hey, we're serving a God that, that he's operating in heavenly places. Uh, and there's some stuff you can't get sitting. Any, anybody, any, I, I know this might be too, maybe, maybe this is way too plain, but I feel like preaching plain right now. Can I tell you why people can, when people can leave delivered, uh, when they go from sitting on the seat to, to standing in agreeing uh, and walking out of their pew. And get into this altar. It's the movement of the motion. It's the progression of change. That you said you know what. I'm not going to sit here and die. How, how, if you only knew how many times. You could have been healed already. You ever. You ever, you ever there, there are people in this room. You are privy to situations in this house, and it blows your mind that when the altar call is made, no movement, no effort, no posture has changed. But what if we all got off our seat? What if we all said, you know what? I am not leaving here 
the same way. Can I tell you how you can leave different? You got to change your posture. You got to change your seat. You got to you got to move. You got to do something. You got to say, God, I refuse to sit here in comfort. I, I want you to sit a while. I'm 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 gonna give me ten minutes. I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm still a young man. But you don't understand how, how easy it is to trade your seat. You don't understand how easy it is to sit at the wrong table. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible tells us that we ought not to sit at the wrong table. He said, don't drink from the cup. Don't drink from the cup of devils. Anybody hear me right now? He said, you can't drink from the cup of the Lord and drink from the cup of devils. You cannot be a partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. It's, I, I, it's just all right if I just tell you what the book says. Which means that it matters where you sit. Because the table that you sit at determines what's going to be prepared when you sit. Is this all right? Listen, I, you might have a different theology. You might, you might feel a whole lot differently about it. But I, 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 just can't, I just can't help believe that you can park yourself down and sit in the comforts of your couch and watch sex-drenched movies. And watch murder after murder. Nudity after nudity. That's why I refuse to sit in it. I hope somebody's hearing me right now. David said, I will sit. I will not sit and sit and put any unclean thing before my eyes. Because when you sit there long enough, your spirit gets comfortable with the things that are trying to kill you. Oh, somebody's preaching with a preacher. Hey, that's why when you are battling stuff, you sit down and you plug up your music. You sit down and you get another drink. You sit down. You ever wonder why the bars make stews? It's because the longer you sit, the more comfortable you become. You ever wonder why movie theaters have comfortable plush seats? It's all about comfort. I hope I'm, ring I hope I'm ringing a bell for somebody in the room right now. Because once you're comfortable, you become desensitized. Your guard is let down. It's much easier to fight when you're standing, when you're moving, than when you're sitting. I hope you're not hearing what I'm telling you right now. I, I promise you, you are at more of a posture defense with an attack upon you. When you're standing on guard, when you're ready for the adversary, when you're watching around and you're saying, I'm seeking, I'm looking, I'm not letting the adversary come in this house and attack my family and attack my children, you got to be on guard because the adversary is walking, which means you need to be walking. Bible says that he's walking about to and fro. Guess what? Even the adversary is not sitting. Because sitting is a stationary, stagnant place of contentment. And you cannot move like you should move when you're sitting. I'm just trying to preach to somebody. You've been sitting way too long. That's why your shout has been lost. That's why your dance is in the closet. That's why your joy, you can't find it. Because you've gotten way too comfortable. Hey, but I come to help somebody get off of your seat. I help some, I hope somebody's hearing me right now. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. when the, You got to move. You got to move. You got to move. Come on, I wish somebody would praise God right now. 
Come on, this ain't, come on, this is not a production. This ain't a show. This is the presence of God. And when God's in the house, when the moving of the Spirit is happening, the Bible says that they that are led by the Spirit, He said, the wind blow it where it lists it, and thou hearest the sound thereof. Because the wind, when the wind blows on leaves, leaves can't stay stationary. When the Spirit of God touches you, you have to move. Something has to happen. But can I tell you that if you've gotten to, point, to the point that you're too comfortable, you've got to change your seat of comfort. And I remember being a young man, and I'm getting ready to end this thing and wrap this up. I remember being a young man. And I was raised in a preacher's home. Can I just tell you? Can I just talk to you right now? Can I be transparent right now? I was raised in a preacher's home. My parents are one, a first generation. They love God with all their heart. They put something in their children to love God from an early age. I was, I was in Sunday school. I, I, was, I was raised under a pew. If you didn't know, there's bubble gum under there. Because bad kids like me put it there. Raise up under a pew. But sometimes you can become so comfortable and familiar with the things of God that they no longer become precious to you. Anybody hear me right now? And from my early years, from my early years, I, I love God. I love going to church. I love everything about church. But, but all of a sudden, my teenage years, there became, there became a pulling of the ungodly that become that, that came that came that became a pulling of the way of the sinner saying walk with us hang with us and a weird church boy thought it'd be cooler to have a different set of friends I hope I'm preaching to somebody right now so I started having different friends, and my friends created different conversations. Grew up in a small country town. There wasn't much to do. And all of a sudden, a seat was presented. And I, I, I came from a family that my, my dad, upon conversion, dad and my family were entrenched Hear me right now. They were entrenched. Their whole life was consumed by the sports world. I want you to hear me right now. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. Right now, your spirit is saying, "Oh, oh." I want you to hear me. Hear me out right now. My, 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 my dad was was moments away from signing a free agency contract with the Houston Rockets. My uncle was drafted as a left-handed pitcher to the Brooklyn Dodgers, Los Angeles Dodgers. My other uncle was on the practice squad for the Dallas Cowboys. So I'm telling you, the seat was made present. But can I tell you that you have to choose what seat you sit in? Anybody hear me right now? You got to choose. You got to choose you this day whom you will serve. Either you're going to serve God or you're going to serve the world. No man can have two masters. You can't sit in this seat and that seat at the same time. You got to choose what seat you're going to. So, so I became infatuated. I became my, my mind began to run as a 13-year-old boy. I began to fantasize about the possibility. And maybe, maybe I can sit in both seats. Maybe, maybe I can go to church. And when church is over, I can sit in another seat. It's like going to a furniture store 
Maybe I can try every chair. But what you don't know is that I, if it's not the church, hear me right now, if it's not the church, there's a comfort that's meant to destroy you. I, I, know what you, I know what you're thinking right now. You said, preacher, you're preaching against sports. No, I'm preaching against anything that can get you too comfortable. You can, you, can, you can work 80 hours a week if you want to. And your desk at work can become more comfortable than the seat at church. So as a 13-year-old boy, I said, maybe I can sit in both seats. So I began to beg my dad to allow me to join one of the sports team. I said, Dad, can I play football? No, son, we, we don't play football. I said, Dad, can I play basketball? No, son, we, we don't. There, there, there's cheerleaders and there's, there's immorality and, and, and trench. And I said, Dad, I, I don't see nothing wrong with it. I, I'm 13 years old. I, I'm saying, Dad, everybody else is doing it. But when you start, you start being in the counsel of the ungodly, when you start being amongst people that don't love God, sometimes, sometimes your, your way gets skewed. And so my brother and I, we sat down with my dad one day and we said, Dad, we, we got a proposition. We said, Dad, we, we, want, we want to be, we want to be, we, we, we feel like we can make it. What about baseball, Dad? What about, what about baseball? We can do it. We can, we, can, we can still dress the way that church folks dress. I hope somebody's still hearing me right now. Because sometimes compromise is comfort. So I said, Dad, we can still dress the, the, the way we can. We can still look holy. There's, there's nothing immoral. Guess what? It's a gentleman's game. We can, we can do it. And so, so my dad says, son, okay, if you guys can promise me to keep God first, Bible, books, and baseball. If you can keep that in order, then, then, then maybe we can, we can make this happen. Can I tell you that when you go from transitioning from walking to standing to sitting, you better be careful where you sit. Because where you sit, the old folks said, where you make your bed, you're going to have to lay in it. And the stuff that you convince yourself is not bad for you. That boy, that mama said, you need to stay away from that boy. If you convince yourself that he's good for you, if you have to persuade yourself that it's okay, it's not okay. I hope I, I don't know. I, I, maybe, maybe, I shouldn't be, maybe I shouldn't be preaching too plainly, but I'm trying to keep somebody out of the seat of death. If you have to reason yourself uh, to make yourself do it, if you have to convince yourself uh, why it's okay, something in your spirit's already told you uh, you don't need to sit there. Uh, you you don't because when you sit there, uh, death is on the way. So can I tell you something that nobody else might not tell you? Can I tell you? Can I tell you that your seat of comfort will kill you? Is, is anybody, is everybody still here? Then? Come on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Listen, it starts with one pill. One. It starts with one text message. One. Am, I, am I missing something? No, sir. It starts with one conversation. One night. Come hang with us just one time. And one turns into two. Turns into three. And before you know it, you don't know what happened. 
So I signed up for the baseball team, 13 years old, going to a small school. We know about the country town. My high school was 7th through 12th grade, and as a 13-year-old, I signed up, tried, up, tried out for the baseball team, and I went out. What I did not know was that the seat was made really comfortable for me. Started playing, and if you know anything about junior varsity and varsity, varsity is reserved for the, the, the 11th and 12th graders, the, the mature young people of the high school, but somehow the coaches thought that this 13-year-old boy should be on the varsity team. So I started playing, but playing changed my posture because the more I played, the less I prayed. Listen, when you stop praying, you better beware. When you start showing up later and later and later for church, I know this is Sunday night. Maybe I should have preached this Monday, but I'm preaching what the Holy Ghost told me to preach. You got to beware when you get too comfortable because the Bible says if any man thinks he stands, you better not be standing. You better not be sitting. You better be walking. You better be moving. Don't get too comfortable. If any man thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he falls. I caught I wish somebody was preaching with me right now. And it, it seems innocent at first. Relationships seem innocent at first. Until the motives are made clear. And the seat has made you comfortable. This is why Delilah had to get Samson sitting because then he got comfortable enough, comfortable enough to lay his head in her lap. I hope I'm preaching to one soul in this. If I can convince somebody to get out of your seat of death uh, and stop being so comfortable and in this revival, you say, you know what? Uh, I, I haven't been feeling like I should. Uh, I've lost something. Uh, I'm not the man I was when I first got in this thing. Uh, if I can convince you uh, to get out of your seat, uh, then bless God, this revival is worth it. Uh, I just come to tell somebody, uh, don't you sit too long. You got to get up. You got to move. You got to change your posture. If you've been praying five minutes, you better start praying ten. If you've been... If you can only fast one day, I challenge you to go three. You've got to move. You can't get comfortable. There's a devil on your trail. And he's walking to and fro. Walking to and fro whom he may devour. It was okay. Can I just be transparent? I thought, yeah, high school ball. It, I, I, in my mind, there wasn't much damage there because, you know, you, you, go, you go and you play a game and you go right back home the same day. Which means I can sit in the pew. And I can sit on the bench. I can sit in the dugout. And I can sit in the church. But the adversary started making the seat more and more comfortable. And so one day I got presented with an opportunity to travel with a major league scout team at 16 years old. And they said, travel with us. I said, well, when do you guys travel? We travel out of state. We're playing other scout teams of prospective players in the country that have great promise. They said, travel with us. Okay, when do you travel? We travel Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Do you have to travel? Yes, we travel on Sundays. Which means, now I have to choose which seat. Because now I can't sit on the pew and in the dugout at the same time. So we started traveling. We started going and traveling, and I missed the service here and there. 
And the more I missed the pew, the more comfortable I got. I want to tell you, if there's, some, if there's people, it, listen, there's only so long that you can hang around folks that all they talk about is being divorced before you get a bright idea. I hope somebody's hearing me right now. I'm, preach, I'm, pre, I'm going to preach to somebody right now. I'm going to preach and tell you exactly what I feel right now in the Holy Ghost. If you keep on hanging around men that they, they can't keep their eyes to their self, your eyes are going to start to wonder. Because when you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly, your counsel becomes your conversation. And so I started traveling. The more, the more and more I sat in the seat, the more comfortable it became. And it came to the point that when God started pulling on the heart of a 16-year-old boy in a camp meeting, I, I knew that God called me to preach. And then I got an idea. I don't want to preach. I like this seat. I want to play. I want to be a ball player because this seat feels a whole lot better. I'm popular. People know me. Preachers, that's nothing cool about preaching. I want to play. So, Brother Seth, I started playing. And I played. And I played. And I practiced. And I played. But there was no prayer. And it got to the point that church became casual. You know what I'm talking about. You show up to church. And it's just routine. No clapping. No praying. No worshiping. Just standing and sitting. What I did not know is that the adversary was strapping me to a seat. And a 13-year-old boy turned 16 and a 16-year-old boy turned 17. When I turned 17, I got a letter in the mail that solidified my seat. I got a letter from this company called Under Armour. Anybody ever heard of that company before? There's Nike and Reebok, and there's a company called Under Armour. I got a letter in the mail that says, Cornelius James Williams, you have been selected as a 2008 preseason Under Armour All-American. I said, I said, from this day, I like this seat. Can I tell you, don't get too comfortable sitting. Don't get too comfortable. If there's something pulling from you from God, you got to pull away from what's pulling you. It was innocent. Yeah, it was innocent. It was no big deal until I said, you know what? I think I can make it. I think I can have God and have this life too. But can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? It don't work that way. I wish I had somebody that would amen me right now. You can't have the world and have Jesus too. You can't have your fun and have God too. Uh, you can't have your sin, your lust, your hiding. You can't have perversion uh, and have power too. You can't, you can't have sin and salvation too. You've got to let one go. You've got to choose what seat uh, you sit in. Uh, you got to choose. I wish somebody was backing me up right now. Come on, there's some relationships uh, that will destroy you. Uh, there's some seats uh, that will kill you. Uh, there's some lifestyles. Uh, if you keep on engaging in them, uh, if you keep on running with the wrong crowd, uh, hanging with the wrong folks, uh, if you keep dabbling with the doubters, there's death knocking on your door. <laughs> and a church boy, yeah, can, I, can, I tell you, can I tell you what the world won't tell you? Can I tell you what they won't tell you? Can I tell you what your co-workers won't tell you? They don't love you. Boy, that hurt. Oh, that hurt. In fact, they talk about you like a dog when you go. 
Because that's why, that's why God tried to tell you don't love the world because they don't love you. If he's got to touch you, he don't love you. If he's saying, boy, what's wrong? What's wrong with it? Just, just five minutes. Come on, just. If he's got to convince you it's okay, he don't, he don't love you. He's just trying to get you in the seat. Some of you are uncomfortable, and I'm glad. Because we're too comfortable uh, to the point that we love sin uh, and we hang out with the world uh, and we don't see a problem with it. Uh, we like it. We love it. Uh, we want some more of it. Uh, but you've got to get out of your seat. Uh, if this preacher makes you uncomfortable, you're too comfortable. I hope somebody's preaching with me right now. If when the preacher starts preaching about pornography, you start squirming in your seat, that's because you've been sitting in front of the screen too long. Come on, if the preacher starts getting on, on lust and start telling you maybe you need to get off of social media, you've been sitting in the seat too long. Uh, God, I wish somebody would hear the Holy Ghost. Uh, I wish somebody would hear uh, God's trying to help you. Uh, that He's trying to help you get to a breakthrough. Uh, you got to get off the chains uh, that's changed you to your seat. Uh, you got to unbuckle the straps. Uh, you got to get out of the chair uh, and say, I refuse uh, to sit here and die. Uh, the devil's trying to destroy you. Uh, the adversary is trying to kill you. Uh, but you better get your shout back. Uh, you better get your praise back. Uh, you better get your victory back. Uh, you better get your family back I caught I feel the Holy Ghost better get out of that seat while you can because you hang around with dogs long enough you'll get fleas that's not just colloquialism and, and, and cliche the Bible says uh, that, that, that you shall not Take that which is holy uh, and put it before dogs and don't cast your pearls before swine. He said, don't, you can't drink from the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You got to choose what table you sit at. Hey, if I were you, I wouldn't laugh at somebody running an aisle. At least they're not sitting. If I were you, I wouldn't mock the shouter. At least they're not sitting. I come to tell you the only way you're going to break free from the stuff that's destroying you. You got to move your muscles because when you get too relaxed, when you get too comfortable, there's a chain waiting for you. There's a chain. Hey, hey, the Bible says that in that day that there's, a, there's, a, there's an adversary, Lucifer, with a great chain that's going to be bound. He's just trying to chain you to the chair. Can I tell you the honest truth? Can I tell you the honest truth? If you sit in the seat long enough, you will die. The Bible says that the wages, the payment, your paycheck for sitting too long is death. And so I walked on a college campus. I, I, know, I, know, I know you look at me in this suit and you think that I've lived in perfection. But the reason why I can tell somebody in this room that you can, you can break away from strongholds is because I learned that I can break away from a stronghold. You see this preacher in this pulpit? Four services ago, I stood in that pulpit. You know what I said? The first thing I said, I am not a perfect man. But can I tell you something about this man? I refuse to sit in the seat of destruction. Can I tell you why? Because I was almost assured and didn't even know it. Because a gang to me was not a gang to the devil. So I started traveling and 
I signed a national letter of intent to play college baseball, and so I went on to play college ball about three hours away from here in Arkansas. And the Bible says something that's so profoundly true. The re, I believe that there, there, are, there are seven things that the Lord do and hate, and one is abomination. And the first thing that God hated is a proud look because pride goeth before destruction. Because pride is the voice that will tell you, you are, you are okay. Pride is the voice that will tell you, don't pray. Pride will tell you, we are all right. Everybody else needs an altar call but you. But pride is the seat. But they won't tell you. What the world won't tell you is that they will chew you up and spit you out. Nobody volunteers to sit in an electric chair. You ask any, you ask any criminal, no matter how much wrong they've done in their life, there is no criminal that volunteers to sit in the electric chair. Because there's no comfortable way to die, not even a seat. But I became so comfortable as a young man, desensitized to the adversary's attempt to destroy me. And I walked on a college campus, just a small country boy. I thought that the seat of going pro was better than the seat of preaching. What I didn't know is I wasn't just sitting in the dugout. Sitting in the dugout turned to sitting in bars. My freshman year, I taste alcohol for the first time in my life. And God will get you sitting. One bottle turns into another. I'm not preaching from a place I don't know. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. I, ain't been a, I, ain't, I haven't been a saint my whole life, so I'm telling you, you can be delivered. And parties and drinking, it didn't stop. The more you sit, the worse it gets. One strap is not enough. And one strap turned into another. Before I knew it, I was sitting at the table of promiscuity. And I thought that I was big and bad and bold because I walk on the college campus and people I didn't even know knew my name. I would see myself on the big jumbos tron and I say, I can't believe that's me. But I'm sitting and I'm dying. And promiscuity turned to pills. Because being an athlete comes injuries. So injuries turn to the need for prescriptions. Is this too plain for anybody? I'm talking about a preacher's kid. I'm not talking about, I didn't just walk off the streets. I sat on the pew. But when you sit too long, you die. It was hard to look my mother in the face when she would come to check on her boy because I would spray myself down with cologne so she wouldn't smell the alcohol in my breath. (laughs) 
And I would go to church and I would try, I would try to feel God, but I couldn't. I would try to sing the songs, but the words wouldn't come out. I would try to lift my hands, but I was using them to do something else. My hands were busy. You know the feeling when you, when you see people shout and run and dance? You know everybody's not mocking. Some people see people shouting and they wish that they had joy like that. I knew people that were going to church and they were living for God for real. But me, no. I was trying to sit in two seats. But what I did not know is I chose my seat. My friends tried to tell me that I was addicted. Because even after the injuries ended, I had full access to painkillers. My wife will tell you. <laughs> when I met her, I was on the, I was on the, the up. I was trying to, I was trying to come out of a stronghold, and you know, sometimes she would call me. She couldn't understand what I was saying. Because a young preacher's kid was high out of his mind. I was sitting in class, high out of my mind. And I would lay down at bed at night. Because the truth is, you know you're sitting in the seat. Some of you know you're sitting in the wrong seat. And I would lay in bed at night and I knew I wasn't living right. And I would beg God. I said, God, please don't let me die in my sleep. I said, God, please, God, I know I'm not living. Please, please just give me another day. I would hold my pillow tight at night, wishing I hadn't messed up my life. I thought, I thought there was no chance I'll ever make it back. And I tell you that the seat that you sit in is a choice. And you can get out of the seat if you want to. <laughs> Come on, I hope I'm preaching to somebody. Come on, if you're battling with nicotine, listen, I'm not trying to preach down to you. I'm preaching with you. I'm trying to help you right now. You don't have to battle no more. You can get out of the seat. <laughs> Spending your paycheck, you can gamble your paycheck away. You can, you can drain your bank account bottle after bottle. I'm pre I, listen, I'm not, there's not one preacher in Pentecost that will ever preach down to not one soul because I know what it feels like to have a stronghold that you want to pull away from. I just want to tell you, you've got to stand up. You've got to get out of your seat. You've got to say, I can't sit here. So can I tell you something? I want everybody this Sunday night to hear this preacher right now. I don't know. I, your pastor and I talked, and I, I said, I said, I said, I'm feeling this. This is not a Sunday night message. I know, I know we want to shout, but some of us cannot shout right now because we're strapped to the seat. I don't, I don't, if we don't, I don't care if we don't shout tonight. I just want you to get out of that chair. 
I just want you to get out of that chair. Come on, can we make an effort? Can we stand to our feet? I just want you to get out of that seat. When I think about the chair, when I think about the seat, when I think about the table, Help, can't help but think about Mephibosheth who was lame and crippled on his feet he did not deserve to be loved according to man's standards there was a king named David that said I'm going to show grace to you and I know life has been hard on you I know you've made some bad decisions. I know you sat at the wrong table. But I want to tell somebody tonight at Souls Harbor, this is your invitation to change your seat. You can come sit to the king's table. If you said, I'm tired of being too comfortable, I want my joy back. Everything I've lost, I just challenge you to get out of your seat. And to reverse the curse of complacency. I want you to go from sitting to standing. I just want to know if you can walk down to this altar. <laughs> I wish you can lift your hands right now. There's some stuff that's destroying you and you don't even know it. There's some stuff trying to kill you and you, you don't even know it because the seat is comfortable. But why would we sit here and die? Why? Why? Why would you let the devil destroy your family when your kids are at stake? Your wife is at stake. Your world is on the brink of breaking. Don't sit there. Get out of the seat of death. Don't sit there. Come on, when was the last time you just lifted your hands and let tears flow? You can't sit there too long. You get there in a place of comfortability and contentment and you will lose the ability to pray. You will lose the ability to connect with God. You will lose the ability to lift your hands. When you're wondering what's wrong, maybe my hands are strapped too much to my phone that I can't lift them up in the sanctuary. Maybe my eyes are fixed on a screen and I can't even seek out to the face of God. Come on, you're not missing anything. You're just missing a seat of death. Come on, the devil's trying to convince you that you need the friends that you want to have. You need the popularity. You need your co-workers. You need the raise. You need, you need it. You need it. It's just a seat of death. Don't sit there and die. Don't sit there and die. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody. Come on, there's some stuff you're trying to break away from. This is your night tonight to get out of the seat. Come on, I know, I know it started with just one taste. Come on, just one taste, just one drink. And now there's something you can't break. But I promise you, my friend, there's a preacher in the pulpit telling you you can get out of the seat. Thank you so much for joining us for service today on live stream. If you'd like to see more content from Souls Harbor, you can check our YouTube channel out. And if you'd like to know some details about the various ministries of Souls Harbor, you can see some of that on our website. We're praying for you and believing that God's moving on you and that his hand is going to work a miracle in your life.